Hello everybody. Uh, welcome to English online classes of JNV Vatmar. Uh, today we are going to deal with our second poem, an elementary school classroom in a slum, uh, written by a very famous English poet, Stephen Spender. Before starting this poem, uh, let us read a brief introduction given in your textbook. Uh, you can see this on your screen. Stephen Spender, 1909 to 1995. Uh, this is his lifespan, almost uh, the entire century, 9 to 95, the 20th century. Stephen Spender was an English poet and an essayist. Uh, he left University College Oxford without taking a degree and went to Berlin in 1930. Spender took a keen interest in politics and declared himself to be a socialist and pacifist. Dear students, uh, this is the first point that uh, you should mark. He declared himself as a socialist and pacifist. Uh, we must understand what a socialist is. Uh, who is called a socialist? Because this poem is also based on the socialism <clears throat> and a person who believes in socialism he is a socialist so let us uh, discuss first what a socialism is and who is a socialist uh, we are not going to discuss uh, technical term socialism as a technical term uh, to our understanding what a socialism is it is an ideology that believes in a system of social equality social equality cultural equality and most importantly economical equality this ideology believes in establishing such kind of equality and to bring about this equality they believe that the certain weaker sections of the society should be provided with the opportunities not by force Mind it. Establishing equality by giving opportunities and not by force. So opportunities must be provided to the weaker sections of the society so that these weaker societies could come up to the level of an average. So the gap between the rich and poor should be filled. Is it clear what a socialism is? I repeat, this is an ideology that believes in establishing the social, cultural and economical equality in a society and to bring about this equality there should be given some opportunities to the weaker section of people so that they could come up with the average class so in the context of our poem we could say this is what is socialism is now let us go further part of introduction books by spender include poem of dedication the edge of being the creative element the struggle of the modern and an autobiography a very famous autobiography world within world and the last line of this introduction about his poem an elementary school classroom in a slum he he means the poet the poet has concentrated on the themes of social injustice and class inequalities mark students mark this the themes of social injustice and class inequalities now the same thing that we have discussed in socialism 
the students uh, as far as uh, discussing social injustice uh, you know everybody knows very well that there is a lot of injustice in the society but when this injustice world is prefixed with the social that uh, it is associated with the social groups that there are certain groups in the society and one group is doing injustice to another uh, the another phrase that is used here is class inequalities so to this uh, to understand this uh, class inequalities uh, we must see this uh, visual see in our society particularly in 20th century in 19th and 20th century uh, we were having the two major classes uh, rich and poor even now we also have the rich and poor people but nowadays there is another class that has been emerged uh, with the middle of 20th century that is middle class so we have rich class we have middle class we have poor class Stephen Spender is talking about the two classes, rich and poor. And there is inequalities and injustice between these two classes. Karl Marx also you know, mentions two groups, haves and haves not. Haves means the group of the people who are having everything, whatever they want in their life. This particular group uh, is, you know, associated. Uh, they are actually the capitalists, the industrialists, the owners of the, uh, the industries. They run industry, uh, so they run business. These are the commercial people. So they are haves because they have everything. And there is another class, those are not having anything, not even the basic needs of the life. They have to struggle very hard to fulfill their hunger, to sleep with full stomach. They have to struggle a lot. And, you know, many of them uh, don't have the homes to live in, the shelter to live in. So this is the, you know, on the capitalist and labor class, the worker class. So these are the constant classes that we could see uh, in the world that we rich and poor. We have other classes also, middle class that we have discussed that, you know, those, uh, these middle class particularly are actually fulfilled with the basic needs but they have to struggle uh, very hard to bring luxury in it this is middle class you and me i think belong to the middle class uh, there are certain other classes also uh, some uprooted class is also nowadays termed like uprooted class means that uh, those who have lost their homes uh, due to some natural calamities they have to leave their land, they have to leave their native place, they have to leave all the resources of livelihood because of uh, <clears throat> some reasons and their everything is uh, uprooted and that is why uprooted class. Uh, we have also refugees, you know in India uh, you could see that there is a lot of discussion that refugees from Bangladesh and uh, uh, Pakistan they are you know, continuously you know, keep coming in India. So refugees, right? uh, uh, refugees are also, you know, uh, you must be remembering the partition of India. And at that time, many of the people from Pakistan have moved in India and Indian people have moved from Pakistan. So these people who have to leave their uh, homes because of some uncertain circumstances have become refugees. So this is also one of the class. Uh, there are uh, people who are outcasts also, outcasts, you know. Uh, certain group of people 
who are boycotted by a certain group of society. So they had to leave their home in that situation also. So these people are outcast. So you could see a lot number of outcast uh, also. So these are some classes. So the poet is talking about this class inequalities in the society in our poem. I think uh, you might have understood the class inequalities and uh, social injustice. Let us read the poem and uh, see what exactly the theme is and how uh, the poet has brought in it. Um, dear student, before started reading this poem, I must tell you that Stephen Spender, apart from being a socialist, was a very famous poet also, rather a very influential poet also. Uh, even today, many literary figures follow him. And his literature, his writing uh, is uh, studied in all the universities, in the schools, uh, as we are studying his poem. So the literature cannot be imagined without Stephen Spender. Such an influential poet he is, such an influential writer he is. And that's because that uh, even after being socialist, uh, while writing his socialist ideas in his writing, in his literature, uh, he has never deviated from the literary spirit uh, in his writing. Uh, such a rich spirit uh, is there in his writing. And that is why he is influential one. So let us read his poem. Uh, the title of the poem, An Elementary School Classroom in a Slum. The very title suggests that this poem is about a classroom, a school classroom, an elementary school classroom that belongs to a slum. He is not talking about a classroom or he is not talking about a school classroom. Uh, of, you know, that we and you, you know, we study in. Ours you know, is a good school, a good school in the sense, a common school, like every school. But a school in a slum is a different one. Do you believe that? Have you visited any school in a slum? If not, uh, if you get the chance, please visit it and see how the slum school is different from our school. You will find definitely a great difference in that. So, poet here is describing an elementary school classroom. Let us read it. The first stanza. Far, far from gusty waves, these children's faces. Far, far from gusty waves, these children's faces. Like rootless weeds, the hair torn around their pallor. The tall girl with her bed down hat. The paper seeming boy with rare size. The stunted unlucky hair of twisted bones. Reciting a father's gnarled disease. His lesson from his desk. At back of the dim class, one unnoted. Sweet and young. His eyes live in a dream of Spiro's game in Chino other than this. Once again, dear students, I suggest you to read the poem, read the stanza. It is given on your screen, the stanza, so that you could understand it better. <coughs> uh, see, uh, if you read it, that uh, you will see that uh, the poet has described uh, so when some children in the classroom, you know, some children's faces and uh, their hair turn around, their pallor. He is talking about a, a girl, a tall girl with her weight, uh, with her head which is weighed down. And there is a boy, paper seeming boy with rare size. Uh, and, uh, some of the children are having the twisted bones, stunted twisted bones. Some of the children also are having gnarled diseases. 
and they have taken it from their fathers, deciding the fathers' knowledge. And there is also one sweet and young boy uh, who is unnoted, who is not noticed, and his eyes live in dream. So the first stanza is actually the pictorial description of the children in the classroom. And the poet has brought here how the children look like. They are shown very weak. The children sitting in the class and reading the lessons from their desk. The physically weak, very emaciated. You know, one of the boys described as paper seeming boy. So like such a thin boy which looks like a paper. Paper seeming boy. Is that it? No. Um, image. A paper seeming boy. A beautiful image. Paper seeming. Actually, we should not say paper seeming because he is describing uh, his weakness. A boy who seems like a paper, piece of paper. Such a weak boy he is. With that size, physically big. And you know, a girl is there whose head is weighed down, bend one. There are some children who are having the twisted bones, stunted bones. Now, this was a very picture of these children that shows that these all children are suffering from the malnutrition, undernourishment, malnourishment. They are very, very unhealthy. I believe that you understand what a malnourishment is. The nutritional food when they do not get this is not the children. They become very weak. Because they you know hardly they could get something to eat because of the poverty, their poverty is become life. So such children are there. We you and you me are very healthy, you know. We have you know the clumpy face, you know, the bright color on our face. Our face is not like their pallors. Pallor is also the, the image that is used by the poet. Pallor. Pallor pale face of the children. Pale face? No, we also get the pale face when we become sick. When we fall ill, that our face becomes the bloodless. So we lose the brightness of the pale. Whereas these children sitting in the class are having their face always pale. Because they are always sick actually. They are ill fed. And their hairs, no? You don't know these hairs we cut now. And we don't uh, get the pain. We have hair cuttings, no? We use the scissors to cut our heads. Do you think that these hairs have the life? I don't know. Because I'm not a science student. You can tell me that. You can understand it better whether hairs have the life or not. But I believe they have. Because, no? There is a difference between the hairs that we have and the hairs these slum children are having. The people who are malnourished, the people who are unhealthy, we could see their hairs, you know, so withered, so lifeless. And they cannot put their hair, they cannot comb their hair and put well. Because there is no life in it. So they are torn around their pallor. And how they look like? They look like rootless bits. Rootless bits. In the palms, you know. On the ground, we see the many, you know, weeds. And in the form, we remove it, we uproot it. 
so the life of these children is also like that they are ruthless not only their hairs they themselves are ruthless these children are ruthless this society this slum people are also uprooted people we are talking about the uprooted class now this slum people is also one of the uprooted class that is why the poet here describes like ruthless weeds the girl there no the tall girl with weighed down head her head is weighed down and what is the weighed down will become said because of the malnourishment because of the unhealthy status of her body she cannot hold her head on her shoulder she could not keep the balance so it is burdened that is why her head is bent down slightly bent down and maybe she is burdened physically she is also burdened you know emotionally maybe certain responsibilities might have got she may be the elder one in the family and she has to look after her brothers her sisters the exhaustion is there she is tired so because of the tiredness because of the exhaustion her head is very tired see the description how you know, beautifully the poet has described this unhealthy status of children the tall girl with her weight down head that suggests the physical social and emotional weakness there is another boy described by the poet that is that's you know paper seeming with rat size by rat size rat size I have seen a rat and his eyes always looking for food always it comes and looking for food it comes and looking for food and at the same time it is also scared the rat no scared so he comes and goes in he comes and he goes in from its home so the poet is describing the eyes of the boy with rat eyes this rat eyes are they are scared looking for the food hungry eyes another thing that he has discussed in this stanza that these children are having the twisted bones and stunted bones and stunted and twisted bones and they are unlucky hair of these bones they are unlucky hair of twisted bones and stunted bones and lucky hair here is they have inherited these bones from their parents and when this you know such kind of something that is we inherited inherit from the parents that comes you know through genes that malnourishment is surpassing surpassing generation to generation the diseases here it is mentioned that the birds that it is he is reciting the father small disease even all disease not means you know the goiter goiter so these children are inheriting their diseases from their parents and they have come they have taken it from their genes so such a low status of malnourishment in the society of slum among the people who are living in the slum so it's not just the matter of one generation it goes generation after generation generation after generation such a long Ma a pre prolonged malnourishment in the society 
is described by the poet. And he is also describing one sweet and young unnoted boy who has lost in the dream. His eyes have lost in a dream. A dream maybe of a sphere. Maybe in a tree room. Tree room? A room. A house that is built on a tree. And maybe something else. So this is the description of the different kind of children sitting in the class who are very weak, emaciated, who are malnourished, who are unhealthy, uh, who are ill fed and they have inherited the different kinds of diseases, their physique, their body is deformed their growth is stunted and not only that the poet has also described it that they are uh, the socially ignored neglected and unnoticed people unwanted people you know rootless weeds this section of the society is unwanted by the mainstream society they are ignored nobody you know bother about them Though we call ourselves socialists, there are a lot of slums, but we have done nothing to eradicate this slum life for the slum people, the poverty from their uh, lives. So, this section is ignored one, neglected one, unnoticed one by the political force, the custodian of the society. So nobody bothers about them. So they are socially ignored, unwanted, unnoticed and neglected people. And these children know particularly how they are. They are scared. They are exhausted. They are broken. They have dreams. One sweet and young boy has lost in a dream. They have dream, but their dreams are confined. And the classroom they are sitting in, they have no spirit of learning. That is why the children, the child like the, that is described here, the sweet and young, are absent minded. They are not attending class. Take on the first line, no? far from the dusty waves, the children's faces, and the all I mean, description goes on the first stanza. That is that is representing all the stanza. The first line represents the all stanza, the first, the entire stanza. How these children's faces are far away from the dusty waves. You see the dusty wheels, no? they are full of life, they are full of power, full of strength, full of energy, the zeal of life. They come and bash on the shores, beaches. So nobody can control them. They are free. Freedom is there. So these children are far away from such kind of joy, full and life of freedom. They lack energy of this gusty wave, gusty waves. They lack charm, the spirit of life on their faces. That is why these faces are described far, far away from the gusty waves. Now you understand how the first line represents the entire stanza. that they are far away from the spirit of life. And what is the spirit of life? Energy, power, strength, nourishment, which is not found with them. Rather, what is found them is later discussed in the stomach. What is found 
mal la disminución. Exhaustion, weakness, neglect, ignored. Okay, uh, this was for all for the first standard. Uh, we will discuss it later in the next lesson. Let's start. Till then, goodbye. Thank you.